My name is Josh Banks. Thank you for attending. Uh, I was up late last night trying to get everything perfect. And then I had this thought, like, why are you doing all that? Nobody's going to be here anyway. And apparently I was wrong. So thank you for proving me wrong. Um, today's topic, we're going to be talking about religion as the greatest ally and enemy of equity. What we're going to be doing is um, a brief overview of, of history and where we'll see different examples of how, um, how religion has been uh, an enemy and an ally of equity. Uh, full disclosure, I come from a Christian background, so if any of my slants sound somewhat Christianese, that's what it is. Uh, so um, so don't, uh, don't be surprised by that. <clears throat> Let's get started. My name is Josh Banks, graduated from Raymond Bible College in 2003. I, what did I do? School of Itinerant Ministry. Um, it's a fancy name for teaching people how to have a business and travel around and do all kind of stuff. Uh, Travis County Sheriff's Office. I worked there for nine years. Corrections Tactical. I got to do a bunch of fun stuff and dress up in cool suits and blow up smoke bombs and things of that nature. Uh, seven years, I was a young adult pastor. Uh, currently, I serve as director of public relations for a nonprofit called The Man and Me. Uh, I also work for the Housing Authority as a programs coordinator for a program called IDADS, Innovative Dads of Action, uh, Developing and Succeeding. Uh, I was involved with it for one year, um, for three years, I've been the coordinator for one, and last but not least, I'm the co-founder of the Mastering Manhood Conference, which is something that we pulled off last year um, with like zero money to start. Uh, a lot of money at the end. We got about 300 young men here, ages 16 and up, of all races, ethnicities, backgrounds, um, to come out and just be committed to being better men. Um, probably one of the hallmarks of my life, one of my proud moments. Um, so yeah, Mastering Manhood, if you've never heard of it, MasteringManhoodATX.com, I would highly recommend you check it out. And uh, we're going to do it again this year. I got in a lot of trouble last year because it was a um, men-only conference. Uh, and there were a lot of ladies that were upset with me, um, which is okay, because they're going to be upset with me this year, too. So we'll, uh, that's who I am, and we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're going to go over a um, brief outline, definition of terms. We're going to talk about a history of racism. We're going to talk about medic theory and scapegoating. We're going to get into the idea of slavery and, and just kind of a brief history of slavery. And then we're going to finish off with what I like to call a faith of equity and equality. We're going to talk briefly about the life of a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, anybody ever heard of him, Bonhoeffer? Okay, cool. Wow. Cool. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about him, and we're going to take some examples from his life and how it can apply to the idea of religion being a better ally of equity and equality uh, than being an enemy of equity and equality. Give me two seconds. I'm going to take this gum out of my mouth. Ooh. All right. All right, I'm ready. You guys ready? Everyone ready? Good? Okay. Boom. Definition of terms. So we're going to talk about race. The term race refers to the concept of dividing peoples into populations or groups on the basis of various sets of physical characteristics. You look this way, so we think this way. You look this way, so we think this way about you, race, okay? Uh, now, this is in contrast, of course, to ethnicity, which ethnicity is describing, like, your culture and the way that you are, you know, because it used to be a time when everybody that had their pants sagging and was listening to rap music was probably black. That's not the way it is anymore. Uh, so culture is different uh, than race. Ethnicity is different than race. There are certain people that may have a shared ethnicity but may not be of the same race. I think that's a good thing. Um, but we just need to know these things. Next, racism. Racism, according to Merriam-Webster, <laughs> is a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Um, raise your hand if you're satisfied with that definition. Wow, nobody's hands went up. I'm at an equity summit. I shouldn't be surprised. Um, it's funny when you talk to people and you try to bring up the idea of racism, this is the kind of stuff that they go to because they're not woke. They're not, they're not in touch with um, 
with what's going on. This is what they go to. And so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but when we start talking about this struggle that exists in the world today, a lot of that struggle is systemic, which is the definition of racism. It's the systemic enforcement of a doctrine, the doctrine that we can separate people and identify people and make people better or worse based upon their race. Not their ethnicity, not the way that they act, not their culture, not where they come from or their background, but by the way that they look. And so when you are in a position of power, you have the opportunity to make the rules. And when you make the rules, you can make the rules in such a way that you get all the advantages. This is the definition of racism. It's the systemic element of this. It's not just saying that we're going to do something. It's being in a position of power to enforce what we said we're going to do. Are you hot? No. I'm not, you want me to open the door? You sure? All right. I can already see in my eval. The class was too hot and he wouldn't open the door. <laughs> just messing with you. All right. So that's uh, the definition of racism. Let's move on. Religion is the state, of, uh, the state of a religious whatever. That's, sorry, typo. Service of worship of God or the supernatural commitment or devotion to religious faith or observance. A personal set of institutionalized systems of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Again, Merriam-Webster. You know, I'm finding more and more that every time I look up Webster's diction, uh, definitions of stuff, I'm like, really? <laughs> I might as well have gone to Wikipedia. I probably got a better uh, understanding of it. Here's what's important to me. The word religion comes from the Latin. They're not sure which word it comes from, but there's two words that they believe it comes from. Number one is religio, which means an obligation. Now, sure, there's that whole idea of like reverencing spirits and reverencing demons and all that kind of stuff, but I just want you to think about this. The word religion from the Latin comes from two words, either one, religio, obligation, bond, reverence, or the other is religare, to bind. Now just, just, I want to let that set in for a second. Because when we think of religion, we tend to think of a series of actions or a series of beliefs that we attribute to whatever deity or deities or whatever. Like, that's what we do to show our commitment. But, but just think of the term to bind, to be bound to. Uh, again, I worked in the sheriff's office for about nine years. I don't generally get a good idea from the term being bound. We used to bind people, and our binding was to restrict. So if you're bound to something, what are you being restricted from? Now, on the flip side, you could be bound to something, and it's not that you're restricted from anything, you're, you're restricted to something. Let's say you're married. You're bound to your spouse or your significant other. And so you've opted to eliminate all other options because of what you have chosen. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to think about. We'll go on. History of religion. This is uh, some really smart guy. He was an anthropologist at Princeton University. He said that religion is a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, persuasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men and women by formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions with such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. It didn't say that they had to be real. It just said that we clothe it in such a way that it's so real and convincing that it feels real. Now, again, we all have, you know, different faiths and differing faiths. And, again, I come from a Christian background. We are the worst at telling everybody else how wrong they are. Or the best. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we are really good to tell everybody else, oh, that's fake. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, that's nuts. Blah, blah, blah. That's the devil. Yada, yada, yada. And half the people that claim to be Christians don't know anything about Christianity. Ha, thank you. Thank you. This is an interactive class. This is, a, this is a conversation, guys. It's not a monologue. Dialogue. Good. Thank you. But think about that. You can dress something up and make it look real, but just because you dressed it up and make it look real, does that make it real? You know, my, uh, a movie that scares me to this day was The Wizard of Oz. 
uh, I don't know what it was, maybe the Flying Monkeys, which actually has a different connotation in this whole Ration Equity <laughs> Summit. <laughs> but um, the whole thing he was doing was a facade. And just because you put on a good show doesn't necessarily mean that the show you're putting on has any type of weight to it. But I'm spending too much time talking about this stuff. We're going to get into the fun stuff in a minute. Uh, legislating morality in the name of a higher cause. If there's no better definition of religion, that's it. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you why to do it. And if you don't like it, guess what? You don't have to worry about me. God's going to punish you. If you study the uh, Greek philosophy, this whole idea of scaring the masses with an unseen threat is very, very old. And they found that it was actually one of the best ways to keep the people in check. Because if I tell you, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to beat you up, then you will evaluate your ability to take me on. And you may or may not decide if, that, that it's worth it. But if I threaten you with something that you can't handle, if you don't do what I tell you to do, God is going to send you to hell forever. And not only is he going to send you to hell forever, but there's going to be fire there, and it's going to stink, and the demon is going to pinch you and stab you and torment you forever. What can you do about that? Especially if that message is coming from somebody that you respect. If that message is coming from somebody that you esteem highly, what are you going to do with that information? You're going to do what they tell you to do. So, the le so legislating morality in the name of a higher cause. I'm going to make laws. I'm going to make rules around what you can or cannot do. Now, again, don't think that I'm trying to demonize anything. However, I do want to make it very clear that there are ways that we think that we may think are our own ideas, but those thoughts and ideas have been placed upon us. And they have been enforced by forces that may or may not care about you as much as they say they do. Just a thought. I'll go on. Uh, religious symbols, Baha'i, Buddhism, Christianity, there's Orthodox, Catholicism, Jainism, Judaism, Satanism, Shinto, Sikhism. If you had never seen those signs, I just wanted to throw this in there so you could see them, so you can say that you've seen them. I want to ask you what the uh, Baha'i symbol is. Take notes. Now you know. <laughs> Boom. Got you. History of religion continued. So whether mankind chooses to acknowledge it or not, man has always recognized his smallness in comparison to the world. Very early in our cultural formations, our curiosity and need to answer questions that were beyond our understanding have led man to look at patterns that can be attributed to something that man can understand. At a basic understanding, our ideas of God or gods have evolved based upon our needs to fulfill basic human needs, food, shelter, children, etc. Most early beliefs or religions and tribal religions are usually sun religions. So let me talk about this. So, I don't know, 50,000 years ago, man walks outside, man sees the sun, sun is shining. Man looks around at the ground while sun is shining, stuff is growing. Man says, sun makes things grow. Things that grow, I can eat. Or I can cut down to make shelter for them. And so these things help sustain my life. And these things happen because of sun. Man recognizes that when sun's not out, things don't grow. It gets cold. Life is not being sustained. So what does man do? Sun must be God. Sun helps me live. But then again, sometimes sun stays out too long. It starts to burn things up. So now what is this sun god doing? Of course, he's mad at me. So what can I do to keep him happy? So we start devising things. Again, these, these systems that we don't quite understand, we're trying to figure out how we can get a grasp or get a hold on these things. And then one day, am I jumping too far? No, I'm not. For example, start talking about the sun thing. Then one day we run into a uh, sun runs into a, a, a cloud. So now sun's covered up. So either God is mad at me or there's another God that's mad at him, so he's covering him up. But in this conflict, 
rain happens. Well, rain is good. So we need rain. So sun god, sun god has hooked up with, you know, cloud god, and they've given us rain to continue to support life. But now rain is too much, so now somebody else is mad at me. You see how this stuff works? Like, this really real simplistic of understanding things that we don't quite understand. And so man, from his earliest beginnings, was always in this uh, uh, struggle or in this journey to, how can I say this, manipulate the gods. Because I want gods happy at me, so what do I do to make them happy? I give him a sacrifice. I, I, I obey this or I do that. I want him happy. And these are just early understandings of, of what our world looked like. And this is just people trying to rationalize how can we do something about this. <clears throat> so while not every religion was a sun-worshipping religion, Sumerians, Egyptians, Indo-Europeans, India, and Romans were, this is according to uh, the Britannica Encyclopedia. I got tired of Merriam-Webster. Um, <laughs> history does show us that religious belief does provide a structure for culture. So here's the idea. Once you get an understanding of something, you dictate that to your, your children. So listen, guys, sun comes out, makes plants grow. If we kill a goat on every second Tuesday, we've noticed that sun comes out, makes plants grow. So kill a goat on every second Tuesday. It's simple. seems comical, but, that's, but just think of the, the simplicity of what we now see in complexity, the simplicity of it. Sun religions, this is uh, the Romans. Uh, they had a sun-worshipping culture. This is the Egyptians. They had a sun-worshipping culture. This is in India. They had some sun worship involved. This is the Sumerians, probably um, in terms of written history, uh, one of the oldest cultures that we can actually observe, sun worshiping culture. And last but not least, everyone's favorite or not favorite. <laughs> Uh, the whole idea of Jesus in terms of how the Romans would display it came from a sun-worshipping culture because the Romans were a sun-worshipping culture. Um, if you're offended now, get ready. The fun stuff is coming. <laughs> I'm just getting started. So here we're going to get into something about this guy named Rene Girard. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this name before. One, two, three. That's about more than I expected. We cannot talk about culture, or I can't talk about culture, without talking about Rene Girard. And pay attention to this part of the talk because this is going to be the foundation and the lens through which the whole entirety of this talk is seen through. Okay? Rene Girard was a French philosopher. He specialized in medieval studies. He migrated from France to pursue a doctorate at Indiana University. He taught at Indiana. University, State University of New York and Buffalo, Duke, John Hopkins, Bryn Mawr, and Stanford. He is most known for his theory on mimeticism and scapegoating. He wrote a number of books called Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, The Scapegoat, Violence in the Sacred, Things Hidden at the Beginning of the World, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. If you've never, ever, 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 ever heard of Rene Girard, I would highly encourage you to figure out who this guy is. And the funny part about Rene Girard, and I'll say this before I tell you what he taught, is that his most famous students, because he's got a couple of students out there in the world that are like billionaires and super, super famous, his most famous students were all marketing guys. Now listen to what I said, they're all marketing guys. This will, that'll make sense in a minute. <laughs> that'll make sense in a minute. I am, I am fundamentally an anthropologist and a rationalist. What I say is that human societies are very different from what specialists call animal society because the former have religion. According to Rene Girard, what separates us from animals is that we can be taught to believe something. Animals have this whole instinctual thing. But we can be taught to believe something. Now, I don't think that that's not necessarily true about animals, because you can teach an animal, like, you know, if the fence is this high, and every time he tries to jump, he gets spanked. But, but that's like a reaction to pain. We can be taught to believe something to the degree that our entire societies are run that way. Maybe it's not different. Maybe it is. Whatever. That's what he said. Gerard is best known for his theory on mimeticism and scapegoating. I'm going to explain what mimeticism and scapegoating is. And again, I, want to, I really want to hammer this part down because this is the lens 
through which everything else I'm about to say is even should be seen through. Mimeticism and scapegoating. Point number one. Mimeticism is the idea that humans, more than any other species, are designed to mimic the example set by a model. Number two. Mimeticism is more than copying in, in, an individual's actions, but it is to mimic their desires. Remember, his best students are marketing guys. When two people want the same things and there is not enough to go around, the end result is violence leading to chaos. Because mimeticism happens quietly and no one wants to take responsibility for the chaos it's blamed on someone else. This class is called Religion, the Greatest Enemy and Ally of Equity and Equality, in case you forgot. When two people want the same thing, there's not enough to go around, the end result is violence and chaos. I don't know if y'all can see this picture. It's two kids fighting over a toy. Parents, how many people are parents in the room? Got kids, okay. Got your kid, two years old, sitting in a room by himself, toys laying all over the floor, chilling, good, happy, right? Cousin comes over, also two years old, okay? <laughs> he walks into the room. First thing he sees is the other child. Fair? Okay. They look at each other, look each other up and down. Cool. Kid that walks in the room sees a toy laying on the side of the other kid. I want to play with that. Now, first kid was fine. He wasn't playing with it. But the moment that kid number two decides he wants to play with it, guess what kid number one does? Well, now I want to play with it. Why? And so now they're fighting over a toy that he didn't care nothing about two minutes ago. Am I wrong? <laughs> At least that's how my kids were, are. <laughs> Am I wrong? What is it that has happened? He just mimicked the desire of another. He saw what he wanted, and because he wanted it, he wanted it. Now, it's really easy to see on a very basic level, but now escalate that into a society. Let's talk about basic needs of humanity. Person number one has a horse. Person number two sees that horse, decides that they want that horse, or a horse. And that's fine as long as there are enough horses to go around. But what happens when desire exceeds the ability to, to fulfill that desire? So now we gotta beat you guys up to get that horse. But everybody knows beating somebody up isn't gonna be the way to do something because once they get better, they're gonna come back. And they're gonna be mad. They're gonna bring their friends. So rather than have to deal with that, let's just kill them and then take their horses. This is the idea of mimetic desire. You can literally mimic the desire of someone else and this breeds conflict and the conflict leads to chaos because now we're all fighting each other. And by the time we're all fighting each other, most of us don't even remember why we were fighting each other to begin with. Mimetic conflict. Because personal responsibility is ignored, scapegoating becomes necessary. Scapegoats are chosen because of their otherness. Example, race, religion, ethnicity, cultural, sexual preference, whatever. Too tall, too short. Scapegoating becomes necessary. The scapegoating results in some type of a sacrificial murder, isolation, or separation, which brings a sense of peace. The ensuing peace is believed to be caused by the murder or the sacrifice of the scapegoat or the victim. Peace lasts until the process is repeated. Scapegoating results in targeted destruction and is made into a ritual, myths are told to justify the killings, religious doctrines and ideology become the result. So here's what happened. We were fighting over something between us, okay? I killed him, but I can't just come and say I killed him because I wanted what he had. That doesn't sound good. What I get to say is, is uh, I'm sorry, and, and so I kill him, his people come back and they get mad at me because I've killed him. So now we're fighting, we're fighting, we're fighting, and it's never ending because we all want the same things, but I don't want him to have it. So what do we do? We figure out this whole fighting thing isn't going to work for us because we're destroying ourselves. We're destroying our cultures. Why are we even mad at each other? I'll tell you why we're mad at each other. We're mad at each other because of the fags. We're mad at each other because of the niggers. I told you I was going to offend you more. <laughs> but does it make sense? We're mad at each other because of the Jews. 
We're mad at each other because of these guys or those guys. And so we that are fighting can agree that we don't like them. So we'll drop our guns and drop our knives to be together to fight them. And so we go and kill them. We go and isolate them. We push them to the side. We throw them out. And we're happy about it. Peace ensues. We're happy now. Yeah, this is great. Problem is we never dealt with the real issue because no one ever dealt with the issue of personal responsibility. Why are we fighting to begin with? When human groups divide and become fragmented during a period of melees and conflicts, they may come to a point where they are reconciled again at the expense of a victim. Observers nowadays realize without difficulty, unless they belong to the persecuting group, that this victim is not really responsible for what he or she is accused of doing. The accusing group, however, views the victim as guilty by virtue of contingent, I can't talk, similar to what, uh, uh, sim ah, stop, similar to what we find in scapegoating rituals. The members of this group accuse the scapegoat with great fervor, fervor and sincerity, more often than not, some, incidents where, some incident, whether fantastic or trivial, has triggered a wave of opinion against his victim, a mild version of medic snowballing and the victim mechanism. This is from the book, I See Satan Fall Light Lightning. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Black Wall Street. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 20s, group of people got together Blacks built a community, one of the most thriving communities in the United States, black or white. Lots of property, lots of businesses. They said that the currency was circulated about 100 times before it actually left the black community and went out to the other community, okay? So they're doing really, really, really well until one day when supposedly some black guy raped some white girl. And so then the whole town was justified to march down there with city council and the police chief and the fire chief and all the people that should be defending the community. All these people were involved and they, walked, they marched down there and the whole place was burned to the ground. Now some conspiracy theorists today are saying that there was a bomb that was actually dropped on it. The point was they all endorsed its destruction. Based on what? Some black guy raped some white girl. More often than not, some incident, whether fantastic or trivial, has triggered a wave of opinion against this victim, a mild version of memetic snowballing and the victim mechanism. I need to hurry, I hear folks clapping, so that means I must need, I'll be behind. Memeticism, in order to justify scapegoating as an acceptable solution to the conflict, societies develop rituals, myths of justification, and religious ideologies. So we have the thing that we do, we have the story that we tell each other why we did it, and then we develop, it's not just that we did it, it's because God told us to do it. Good? Go on. Scapegoating. Turn on the TV, politics, doesn't matter who you, you just, once you've heard this, you're going to see it all the time now. Every time you start seeing people blaming, oh, it's their fault, you're going to see it all the time. There are people that say Gerard didn't know what he was talking about. Whatever. Memeticism and scapegoating continue. The scapegoating mechanism can be identified in these factors, caste systems, social classes, race, and gender superiority. Do you see it? I mean, does that make sense? We pick those people to be the bad people because we're the good people. We're good because we're white. We're good because we're black. We're good because we're educated. They're bad because they're not. Not whatever. And so it, it's justified for us to do what we do because they, are, they deserve what they're getting. Oh, we're going to get into that. I need to hurry up. Sell, selling slavery from the pulpits. Enters human history with civilization. Hunter-gatherers, primitive farmers had no use for slaves. Uh, they collect and grow enough food for themselves. The more mouths, is more responsibility. So at the earlier stages, people didn't really have a use for slaves. They just did enough to take care of themselves. Until you start getting bigger. You get bigger, and now you have cities, and you have all this kind of stuff, and so you can do more stuff, and so you need more hands. And so as you need more hands, you're starting to think, man, we don't have enough kids, and man, we have to pay people, and we have to be fair. I don't want to do that. That's no fun. So what do you do? You, break, you make conflict. You start wars. You fight with other people. You take over a town. You take over a city. And then you take the people that you get from those cities and the towns, and you make them your servants, your slaves. That's kind of the idea of how slavery, slavery, can I talk? <laughs> slavery started. This is according to worldhistory.net. Slavery continued. Slavery can be traced back to ancient Babylonians, Code of Hammurabi. Most civilizations had a form of slavery, some more barbaric than others. African slaves were in great demand as European countries 
such as Portugal and England began expanding their influence to the New Americas. We're doing a lot of cool stuff over in Brazil, and we don't want to do all the work, so let's get these guys, because they can do it. That's how a lot of stuff started. Slavery continued. So here we're going to see the abol uh, abolitionist movement. This guy by the name of George Fox, he was a Quaker, Quaker Oats. Mm. Um, George Fox had this idea being a devoutly religious person. Now again, we're talking about how religion can be the greatest enemy and ally to equity. George Fox had this idea, and the idea was the gospel was to be preached to every creature and is the power that giveth liberty and freedom and is the glad tidings to every captivated creature under the whole heavens. His thought was, these are people. These people deserve to hear this message that I personally believe, George Fox. And so it is my obligation to give them the same liberties that I experience. So what is he now being? He's becoming an ally of equity and inclusion based on his religious ideology. I see that people should be free, so how can I sit back and allow people to not be free? So George Fox started to petition hardcore for freedom. It was because of George Fox that the Quakers in the United States decided to free all of their slaves. The northern state, other northern states began to, to follow this, this, this model because he taught them something. He was passionate about something. It was his abolitionist movement that influenced a man by the name of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce is a guy that was in England, and he became a devout Christian and being influenced again by George Fox felt that it wasn't right for us to have slaves. So he started petitioning and petitioning and submitting legislation and submitting le legislation, and he was one of the driving forces behind why it became illegal to own a slave in England. At first they said, we're not gonna have any more slaves, and so whoever you got, who so you got. But then they got to the point where they said, all right, we're gonna free everybody. He was one of the driving forces behind that. Again. Religion isn't necessarily bad. Religious belief isn't necessarily bad. But it can be weaponized. Or it can be used to help. Here's two examples of people that used it to help. Now, with all this movement going on um, between Fox and Wilberforce, there was a group of people that wasn't trying to hear it. <laughs> the South was not trying to hear it. South in the United States was not trying to hear it. I don't care what y'all say about freeing those slaves, Jesus this, God that. No, this is working for us, okay? Um, <laughs> but again, think about medicism. Our rituals need to be justified, but we can't just have the justification be localized. It can't just be me justifying it. It has to be bigger than just me, so we need religious ideology to give us the ability and the freedom to do what we want to do. We're going to get into that. Josiah Prince, anybody ever heard of that guy? He wrote this crazy, he wrote this book called Biblical Defense of Slavery. I'm just going to read you some of the stuff that's in this book. Um, yeah. Noah said, we're going to get into that real quick in a minute. I'm going to read this first. Noah said, by the spirit of prophecy, words too terrible to fall from a parent's lips without a reason entire, entirely resistless. So he couldn't control it, couldn't stop it. The words which he pronounced and was moved thereto by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, contained in them a curse, a dreadful curse, which not only covered the person and the fortunes of Ham, but that of his whole posterity also, to the very end of time, for aught that appears to be the contrary. I'm explaining the curse of Ham. We're talking about, again, mimeticism. If you have a ritual, you justify it, and then you give a religious ideology to it, okay? So we've got one part of the world that's saying, because of God and because of Christ, because of Christian, Christian beliefs, we're going to get rid of slavery. You have the other side saying, because of God, because of our beliefs, we're going to justify slavery. And so here's our justification. It's called the curse of Ham. There's a story in the Bible about Noah's Ark. Noah gets on this boat. He's with his children, saves the whole world. The world, flood, the world floods over. They get out of the boat. They get out. Noah's drinking some wine, chilling, having a great time. 
having probably too good of a time. Noah gets drunk, really drunk, okay? So while he's drunk, he has three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham, according to the story, laughs at his father's nakedness because he's just like stupid drunk, right? And if you really study this thing out, there are those that believe he didn't just laugh at his father's nakedness. There are those that believe he actually sodomized him, okay? And so after he gets done doing whatever it was that he did, he tells his brothers about it. His brothers are mad. So they go to preserve the legacy of their father. They cover him up. His father wakes up from his drunken stupor, probably very much hungover, and he looks at his son and he curses him. Now, if you look at it technically, he doesn't really curse him. He curses his son. But the point was, this became the justification for slavery. Gosh, I did it again. <laughs> Learn the, the slavery from a religious standpoint because it's God's will for us to make those blacks our slaves because that's what he designed. Josiah Prince also says it was from the lips of the man Noah that the everlasting God chose to announce the curse and malediction of servitude and slavery upon Ham and his race as it is written starts giving biblical justifications for it. So think about what's going on. It's not that I have this idea, it's that God gave me an idea. And so when I as a preacher stand up and teach the congregation because people believe what their pastors tell them, what am I teaching them? More stuff about how Ham was supposed to be everybody's slave and his kids are supposed to be everybody's slave. Now let's look at a map of the world. So they divide the world into where they believe Noah's sons went. Here's a good son, that's where all his good kids went. Here's another good son, here's where all his good kids went. Here's the bad son. And that's where all his bad children went. Is it starting to see, like, it's starting to make sense in terms of why slavery happened? Um, this guy says some cool stuff. He says basically that um, because of the uh, political conflict about slavery, he basically says that, you know, once all this talk is over, God's going to come back and justify us and vindicate us that what we were doing was the right thing to do in terms of owning slaves. This guy goes into the whole thing about uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence talking about certain inalienable rights. He says that instead of inalienable rights, meaning that they're God-given, he was saying that there's like, well, that's not really what it means. What it really means is like, if you were to sell yourself to be a slave, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. And so nobody would agree with that. Like he gets into like a bunch of stupid talk. It doesn't even make any sense. Um, but this is a politician. And we have never heard politicians say stupid stuff that doesn't make sense. Again, mimeticism, rituals, myths of justification, religious ideologies. I'm going to hurry up. Uh, but I want to focus on this too real quick. Take five seconds. Reverend Finnis Dake uh, published what's called Dake's Bible. Um, I was very familiar with this growing up in my world because Dake's Bible is probably one of the most popular Bibles used by preachers to study with and to preach from and to teach from because of the commentaries. The dude had so much commentaries. The guy would get so deep into the Greek and the Hebrew and all that kind of fun stuff. And tucked deep inside of Dake's annotated Bible was this one little thing he had called 30 Reasons for Segregation of Races. And people wonder why slavery, uh, not slavery, but why separation and segregation exists. Half the time it comes from the pulpits. We preach ideologies to people, don't even realize we're doing it. And tucked deep inside the Bible that all these preachers were studying from, he started a Bible school, he was training pastors, blah, 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 and tucked deep inside of that is this, 30 reasons for the segregation of, race, of races, and then he gives scriptural background for all of it, to, to, to support all of it, 30 reasons. Makes sense when you look at what's really going on, but when people don't see what's really going on, they're like, I don't get it, I don't understand. Why are you guys so mad? Whatever. 30 reasons continue. There's a whole bunch of reasons. Google it. 30 reasons for the segregation of races. It'll be there. I promise you. Uh, it wasn't until recently that they actually started to reprint their Bibles. I'll tell you why they started to reprint their Bibles. Um, there was a pastor. Man, I'm going to take time. I'm going to do it. Whatever. I went to a, a college. The pastor of that college got up one day because that church was busing in kids from the bad part of town. Okay. So one of these kids from the bad part of town in this nice little suburban area uh, decided to get one of these nice little suburban girls pregnant. Daddy was not happy. Not that she was pregnant, but that she was pregnant by one of them, okay? Daddy goes to the pastor. 
says something to the pastor. You need to talk about this. You need to do something about this. So this guy over a worldwide, <laughs> who's, who's in charge of a worldwide ministry, gets up in front of his congregation, and he starts basically saying, we taught our kids that you can play with them, but you're not supposed to date them. Okay? So a friend of the ministry, black guy, got, gets mad, very, very mad. And he decides to preach for a year and a half every Sunday and every Wednesday about race, religion, and racism. A year and a half. Think about that. A year and a half, every Sunday, every Wednesday, this pastor gets up and preaches about this. And he brings out this nice little tidbit about Dick's annotated Bible. And they were not happy because he got a lot of attention. So they started reprinting their Bibles after he continued to harp about this. I'm going to go on. Blah, blah, blah. Faith of equity and equality. A man by the name of Dietrich Bonifer. Bonifer was uh, born in 1906, died in 1945. He was born to a wealthy family. His father was a psychiatrist. His mother was a teacher. Grandfather was a theologian. He decided a small child to study theology. So here is an aristocrat in Germany. He comes from a wealthy, wealthy family. He has money. He has prestige before he's done anything. He's a genius. Genius, genius, genius. And he decides, of all things, to become a theologian. They wanted him to be a psychiatrist like his father or a lawyer. He decided to become a theologian. So he goes to school in Germany. He gets his doctorate. He's the, one of the top of the line there in Germany. And he wants to start studying a little bit more because he's so young. He had accomplished so much so quickly. And he couldn't get uh, ordained yet, according to the, um, the German church, because they don't have separation of church and state there at the time. It was, it was a state controlled. So he couldn't get ordained. So he wanted to study more. Um, but he wanted to study from a broader perspective, so he goes to the United States uh, and Union Theological Seminary in New York, okay? So here's this very smart, very rich white guy from Germany who has the whole world going for him, and he goes to school, Union Theological Seminary in Germany. I'm sorry, in New York. While he's there, uh, he meets a guy by the name of Albert Fisher. Albert Fisher was the son of the pastor of the uh, was it 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Al Birmingham, Alabama. Everybody remember I Have a Dream, Martin Luther King? That's the church. This guy's father was that pastor. So he becomes, uh, he was one of the roommates and friends of this guy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he comes from a whole line of educated preachers. His grandfather was a freed slave. They had figured out a way to get educated through that whole time. These guys are college educated in a time where blacks did not get college educated. So he is like on point, and he's going to finish up his degree at Union Theological Seminary with this guy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So he, as if you would know, you hang out with your black friends, they're going to take you places. <laughs> uh, and that's what happened in this story. Um, Fisher takes Bonhoeffer to Harlem during what's known as the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem Renaissance is, a re is, is the result of what they call the uh, Great Migration. Um, Harlem Renaissance black culture. This is Abyssinian black Baptist Church. At the time, it was the largest church in America. So the Great Migration, basically, when af after slavery happened, people said, we don't want to stay around here. We're leaving, going somewhere where it's better. So they estimate about 300,000 300, blacks left the south and migrated to the north. And when they migrated to the north, one of the most popular places for them to go was Harlem. And so they all went to Harlem. So during, it started what was called the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance basically was a whole bunch of black people that were finally experiencing freedom in its totality. There was a concept called the New Negro Movement. And the New Negro Movement meant we were invisible before, nobody noticed us before, this is the New Negro, y'all gonna see us now. Kind of like people are getting with the whole Black Panther movie, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, Harlem Renaissance lasted from 1910 to the mid-30s. Uh, the Depression basically kind of killed it out. Um, 300,000 new Negroes, uh, prominent, W.E.B. Du Bois. Everybody ever heard of W.E.B. Du Bois? Mm -hmm. Everybody ever heard of Booker T. Washington? Oh, yeah. Anybody know about their little debate? Oh, yeah. mm. Side note, you know there's more schools named after Booker T. Washington than there are W.E.B. Du Bois? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's no accident. Uh, pictures, jazz was booming, music art, literature, black people were for the first time able to express themselves and this white rich dude from Germany is getting thrown right in the middle of all that. And he was a very religious man, he had his doctorates in theology and whatnot in Germany, but for the first time he went to a place where the people that were worshiping this same God weren't on top of the world. And it boggled his mind. 
How are these people that are just recently freed from slavery, just now starting to get some rights, have no rights really, but they're just now starting to get anything, why do they worship the same God? Harlem's theology. Harlem thinkers began to point out the faultiness of Europe as center, as center indoctrination. So according to Reggie Williams, the infection occurred when theology was merged with the colonial system to provide religious authority for centering the world on European imagination, making Christ a white European man and to offer apologetics for the domination and authoritarianism. Go back to mimetic theory, rituals, myths, religious ideologies. We don't like them. We want to persecute them. We're going to create a story for why we did it, and now we're going to justify it by God. This is what was happening, and this is what they were starting to talk about now for the first time in American history. Uh, leaders like W.B. Du Bois began to depict Christ from an alternative perspective. Uh, Christ identified with those who suffered for the first time. Because normally in history, when you study religions, the God favored the winners. We win because God wants us to win. Okay? You lost because God wants you to lose. But now, for the first time, they're starting to use religion from the perspective of, wait a minute, there's a God, we serve a God that actually identifies with those that are losing, those that aren't on the top of the world. It was a, it was a big, big change. Uh, and he talks about the song, but basically identifying Christ with those that suffer. Um, there were a lot of literary works that were done that continued this idea. Um, du Bois uh, had Jesus Christ in Texas which is part of his lynching parables. Basically, he got lynched. Um, Claude McKay's The Lynching, uh, Connecting Christ with the Persecution of the Black Community, George, Douglas's, George Douglas Johnson's Christmas Greetings, Langston Hughes' Christ in Alabama. Check this out. Christ is a nigger beaten in black. Yeah. Counties Cullen's The Black Christ. People started identifying Christ with those that suffered. That's uh, Christ in Alabama. Uh, Bonifer wrote about the debate between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Basically what he says is Booker T. Washington wants the blacks to just sit down and shut up and go back to where they were. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois actually has pride. That's basically what he said. Uh, R.L. Williams said, when Christianity offers, the acceptance, offers acceptance rather than resistance to injustice, it becomes sycophantic to white racism and a theological justification of black subhumanity. Adam Clayton Powell, he was a pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church. That's the church that Bonhoeffer became the Sunday school teacher at. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was a really, like, revolutionary thinker in terms that he was a black guy pastoring the largest church in America, and he would appoint white pastors and white Sunday school teachers and people of different races because he believed that religion should be the greatest ally of equity and inclusion. And so when the Depression happened, he was the main proponent going out to all the other black pastors talking about, why aren't you feeding your people? Why aren't you making sure people have food? Why aren't you making, making sure that people have shelter? And so Adam Clayton Powell was the pastor presiding over the church where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the Sunday school teacher. So again, this white aristocrat is sitting up under all this kind of stuff going on. He's reading the books. He's seeing the, the, uh, um, the debates. He's seeing the whole world that he's been thrust into. And it's affecting him. It's changing him. That's Adam Clayton Powell. So Bonhoeffer's return to Germany. I'm going to breeze through this stuff so I can get done. He goes back to Germany. He goes back and starts studying in school, gets some more stuff. He tries to be a pastor. He's still kind of too young. As he goes back to Germany, the Nazi regime is starting to take over. The Nazi regime is slowly making their influence felt in Germany, and he is slowly resisting it. And so as a pastor of a church, he had friends that are pastors, but they were Jews. And so then the Christian, there's a Christian sect of the, the Nazi uh, regime that came in and took over the churches. And they said, all right, now it's illegal to be a Jewish pastor. And Bonhoeffer was ticked. Why? Because Bonhoeffer just came from Harlem. This is what they're doing to people over there. This is how they're treating people over there. And so the Nazis come in and they start doing all the same things in Germany that he noticed was happening to the blacks in the United States. And now, again, this is Bonhoeffer who's rich, he's affluent, he's educated, he has no reason to get involved in the drama that's going on in his world. All he has to do is sit down and shut up and everything will be good for him. We're talking about how religion can be equity's greatest enemy and greatest ally. We've seen how it can be the greatest enemy. But here's a guy that the only reason he got involved is because religion can also be its greatest ally. He said that he wasn't even a believer in Christ until he got there and he saw a black Christ. And so 
as the Nazis continue to take over and the church being taken, uh, being a, a government church starts excluding people, he leaves. And he's like, all right, I'm getting out of here. But then he comes back because he's like, I can't sit back and do nothing while my people suffer, while my friends suffer, while the people I love suffer. So he goes back. He starts an underground church called the Confessing Church. He starts training pastors underground, illegal. He starts bringing in Jewish people underground, illegal. He starts helping people leave that need to leave. He starts giving food to people that, that are hungry. He, he focused all of his time in the broken down areas where nobody else cared about because he did care about that to the degree that now he's in violation of the law and doesn't care about it. He's telling all his friends that Hitler's going to bring this nation to hell, basically, in a time where you don't talk about your leaders like that. And so he gets thrown into a concentration camp. He spent his whole life doing what he did, changing his world. He's one of the best, greatest theologians of all time. But he was motivated by seeing and relating to people that he didn't understand. And it changed his life. He died in the concentration camp two weeks before the Allies came and liberated it, executed it. We'll finish with this. There's a story in the Bible about a man who comes to Jesus trying to be a hot shot, and he says to Jesus, okay, so what am I supposed to do to be like, you know, the best of the best? And Jesus says, um, um, well, do these laws. And he said, well, I've already done all that kind of stuff. And he said, um, okay, well, love God and love your neighbor. And so the guy, being a smart aleck, said, uh, okay, well, who's my neighbor? Good question, right? Jesus tells a story. He said that there was a man who was traveling, and he uh, fell among thieves. The thieves robbed him, they stripped him of all of his clothes, and they left him for dead. And as this man lies on the ground, about to die, a priest walks by. And the priest sees him there, beating, beaten, battered, bloody. But the priest is thinking about, well, I, I have a reputation. I got on my good clothes, got my church clothes on. So the priest doesn't want to have nothing to do with him. So the priest walks, walks by him. Next person that walks by him is a lawyer. And he knows the law. He knows what's good and what's bad. And he's, you know, a real, you know, put together person. And he sees him. Well, I can't do that. It's going to tarnish my reputation. So he walks by. The third person that walks by is a Samaritan. And it's funny that the story is called the story of the Good Samaritan because that was kind of like... Um, saying jumbo shrimp. Like there's no such, like shrimps are small. And there, wasn't so, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. Samaritans were bad. Like everything about them was bad. But this guy that didn't relate and, I didn't, and couldn't identify or shouldn't have been able to identify was the one person that showed love to this man. Why? Because he met the need when the need was there. So we talk about how religion can be equity's greatest enemy and ally. At the end of this story, Jesus asked the man, who was the one that was uh, the most neighborly? Who was the one that was a neighbor? And he said it was the one that showed mercy. It is our responsibility, I don't care what faith you're of, it is our responsibility to not allow our ideologies to make us hate and make us treat people less than what we would want to be treated. If your faith system, whatever it is, causes you to hate, you may want to check your faith system. Jesus told the guy, go out and be a neighbor. Go do the same. I'm done. Josh Banks, that's me. Follow me. Email me. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you.